Welcome to the August uh, DevOps Meetup, Bucks County DevOps Meetup. Um, I'm pleased to have Mitchell come all the way here from San Francisco to talk about uh, Vagrant and Packer. Um, so uh, I won't waste any more time. So 
a lot of times I'll be reading the internet or something and see some cool new software. Um, and to play around with it, I just spin up a virtual machine, compile it, you know, play with flags, like destroy things. And I don't really need to worry about if I'm ever going to really use it or anything, because at the end of the day, I just kind of, or at the end of me playing with it, I just kind of destroy the VM and I'm back to normal. So those are the useful things uh, that they kind of adds to your to your uh, work process. It's most of you probably already know it. If you're still trying to learn Vagrant or trying to teach people Vagrant, there's a book. And I'm really only telling you this for informational purposes. I know there's one other like author here, and, and but you'll know like don't if you want to support me, don't buy this book because you you'll pay like thirty dollars and I'll get like two dollars. So don't worry about buying this book. That's not a good investment into me. Uh, but if, but if, if you like, you know, books are good teaching tools, and if people, if you have someone who prefers a book over documentation or something, then this is not a bad way to go. Um, so next, really quickly, I want to talk about uh, something I call the Tau of Vagrant, and this is actually from the book, but people like it so much that I kind of just mention it where I can. So the Tau of Vagrant is about the workflow of Vagrant, and this is over the... Vagrant's about four years old, three and a half years old, and over the life of Vagrant, uh, I've seen a lot of companies use it and help them get started with it, and there's really just common patterns that come out of how everyone uses it. And these aren't something that I prescribe on people, but they just kind of naturally happen. And it's helpful for people um, to know, like, okay, we have a technology, and we kind of know, like, how it works, but we don't know how to actually use it in our company. And this is really helpful to just know what other people are doing uh, from a high level. Uh, and this is online too. If you, the actual, actual like four paragraph excerpt from the book is online. If you want to read it word for word, but I'm just gonna you know one sentence to go over things. Um, so from the developer's side, I think there's two sides to vagrant usage: the dev side and the op side, um, or they're the same. But from the dev side of things, the idea is you check out any project in your organization, you run vagrant up, um, you wait a little bit, and you have a fully running dev environment. Right? That's that's the idea. Uh, developers continue to work in their own browsers, their own editors, um, any other tools. They, as many tools as possible within reason should be able to remain on their own machine. Um, the existence of Vagrant is, for from the developer side of things, mostly unimportant to them. Uh, the important part about Vagrant is that it just creates consistent uh, and stable dev environments when they want it. So uh, one company, one big company that uses Vagrant is Yammer, um, and I think they're, I think they're close to like 300 employee uh, developers now. Uh, and if you ask any of those 300 developers uh, what Vagrant is, they might know, but most of them actually don't know that when they come into work every day, that's when they're when they're hitting, they have a new development environment button, like um, their thing they built, it's actually just running Vagrant. And they don't know that, but it is. So <coughs> Vagrant isn't that important to developers. It, it shouldn't be. Um, from a systems operation side, it's a little more important. Uh, the idea of yeah, systems ops, or DevOps, or ops side, is uh, you bigger it up, and then you have just a complete sandbox uh, to test op scripts and iterate within there. Uh, the automation that systems uh, people develop should be used for both production and development. And you don't get this for free. It's not, you can't just, if you have a full automation stack set up for production using Chef, you can't just install Vagrant and expect all that to just work within VirtualBox or VMware or something. There's a little bit of twiddling needed, um, but it's really not much. Like, even in the biggest uh, situations, I haven't seen it take more than a couple days. It's mostly, you know, like, if we're in Vagrant, let's not install monitoring stuff because that's a waste, and, you know, things like that. And the idea is that with every Vagrant app, the devs are going to get the fully provisioned environment using the same scripts as production. That's, that's a pretty cre uh, key part. And whether you're a dev or an ops person, at the end of the day, you just clean up with Vagrant Destroy, Vagrant Suspend, or Vagrant Halt. Um, you can use your imagination to figure out what those do, and you're probably right. Um, and the most important thing, is, again, is after this, you just run you just run Vagrant up, and it gets you back up and running. So you can be done with the project, uh, but realize you need to do a little more, run Vagrant up, and you'll be there, or just come in the next day and run Vagrant up, and you'll be there. And this knowledge transfers to every project that uses Vagrant. So if you have one person who's only worked on like admin dashboards for two years and suddenly you need him to work on like, uh, I don't know, like metrics or something, marketing on this side. Um, he could just jump on that project and there's gonna be a you know, technical knowledge he learns about the actual project, but getting it up and running is not gonna be one of those learning 
but instead, he just runs Vagrant up and, and it's working. Uh, but it's important to remember that all these things I just said uh, are kind of what people are doing, but Vagrant is still a general purpose tool, so you should use it in a way that just works best for you. So don't try to wrap, if you're using Vagrant, don't try to wrap it around these models. Um, it's likely that as you just try to work, do what works best for you, that this will actually just emerge over time. Um, but if you try to force it, uh, I've seen, I've seen it would not work so well. Okay, so let's talk about a brief history of Vagrant. Three slides, brief history. So in Vagrant started in 2010. Vagrant uh, 0.1 was released in March, I think, of 2010. And I'm going to use this car analogy. So Vagrant 0.1 was kind of like this car. And I don't know what it is, but it's old. I know it's old. Um, and it was kind of like this old car that it's, you know, it was kind of cool, but people weren't too sure about it. Uh, it only came in like one, this car only came in like one color, only did one thing really well, that sort of thing. Um, Vagrant was pretty inflexible. So um, at 0.1, Vagrant only worked on Max. It only spun up VirtualBox VMs. Those VMs could only be reasonably recent Ubuntu VMs. It could only provision things with Chef Solo. It couldn't even do like Shell scripts, only Chef Solo. Um, and a bunch of other stuff. So it was pretty much restricted you to one use case, which was my use case. Um, and but it was it was interesting enough that people were paying attention to it, or a handful of people, like 20 people, were paying attention to it. Um, and development kind of just continued over time. Uh, two years later, Vega 1.0 came out, and this is last year, early last year. And uh, it's kind of like this Honda Civic, the Civic. Uh, it's reliable, you know what you're getting, a lot of people use it, there's, there's a place to get help like, if you need it. Um, it's just an all around like safe bet sort of thing. So Vega 1.0 was uh, the first stable release where I marked uh, stable release and a lot of the inflexibilities of 0.1 uh, were gone. So 1.0 works on Mac, Windows, and Linux. Uh, you could run any sort of Linux VM. Um, it works with only VirtualBox still, but you can now provision it with Chef, Puppet, Shell Scripts. Um, it was, what ended up happening is 1.0 was good enough to be adopted pretty widely. Um, and a lot of places are still just on 1.0 and happy, and that's fine. Uh, and then going forward, uh, uh, about a year, exactly a year actually, when 1.0 came out, 1.1 came out, and now we're on 1.2 and heading towards 1.3. Um, 1.1 and onwards is kind of like this Tesla. And in that it's it's really shiny and it has a lot of like cool new things, but people aren't too sure about what it's doing. Like they're not they're not sure if they should be excited about it or if it's just gonna flop. Vagrant so, uh, one point one gets rid of the the last real limitation in Vagrant, which was VirtualBox. So one point one and forward works with um, anything, as you'll see, um, but primarily you know VMware and other desktop hypervisors. Um, it it adds a whole new plugin infrastructure. It's a lot of it's a lot of neat things, um, but it keeps all the old features. So we'll talk about 1.1 uh, right now. So instead of just looking at the Tesla, which I like to just look at, <coughs> I see enough of them in San Francisco. It drives me crazy. But uh, we'll actually just talk about 1.1. So 1.1 is the same vagrant you know. Um, if you if you are just coming from vagrant 1.0 and you just install 1.2. You won't be too surprised right away. Um, it's all the commands are the same, actually. All the commands are the same. You still bigger up, still bigger destroy. It's very, very similar. Um, I don't know why this is more important, but bigger uh, 1.1 onwards is actually backwards compatible. So if you have a 1.0 bigger file, you could just install 1.2 and bigger up and see if it works. Um, it should work. Uh, the only reason it won't work, and that's the asterisk, is plugins. So if you have bigger 1.0 plugins, you have to get rid of all. It like 100% won't work with any sort of plugin, um, but that's usually not too hard um, to just pull them out. So uh, yeah, I'll tell you, actually I'll tell you the story later. But they're backwards compatible, and that's really important if it's not it's a bug. Uh, it's the path to Vagrant 2.0. So I don't know if, how many of you were around before Vagrant 1.0, uh, but what I warned people was that during the 0.x series things could change. Uh, but at 1.0, I would keep the Vagrant file stable so that your configuration defining your VMs would not have to change anymore. Um, and I'm upholding that promise with this, but it's the same thing with Vagrant 1.x. So 
1.1, 1.2, 1.3. I might change things. I haven't yet, but I might. Uh, but at 2.0, I'll mark it good again, and we'll have stability. Um, but and we're heading towards that direction. But there's a lot of work to be done. So in Vagrant 1.1 and 1.2, providers were the big deal. Um, providers are what the non-VirtualBox things are called, or VirtualBox too, but the, the things that run basically compute resources for Vagrant. And I'll cover providers more in depth in a second. 1.3, um, we get automated box building is coming. Um, that's actually Packer. Uh, Packer is its own thing, but it's going to be integrated more tightly into Vagrant, and that'll be the automated box building thing. Uh, Mac Windows Guest support is really close. Ma actually, Mac support's done. So Windows Guest support's really close. Um, and version boxes are coming in. And I won't talk too much about these because they're vaporware. And I don't really like talking about vaporware that much. Um, but I'll mention it briefly as, as it makes sense. But what I really want to talk about is multi-provider because it exists now and you can use it now and it's, and it's new. So multi-provider, it's first important to understand what a provider is, because that's some terminology. Uh, a provider basically manages compute resources for Vagrant machines. So what that means is when you run a Vagrant up, um, which is the command to give you your dev environment, when you run a Vagrant up, Vagrant goes to the provider and says, hey, I need something that could run stuff. And the provider gets that thing and says, OK, I got it. Here's SSH credentials, and Vagrant does other stuff. So uh, in this terminology, Vagrant 1.0 is the only provider. Um, but heading towards bigger 1.1 onwards, uh, and now works with all of these things. Um, and I put your toaster in there because it's a plug-in API, so you could actually plug in your own systems into it. And where this is most uh, useful for people, I found is very big companies that have already invested a ton of money in their own, you know, inventory management systems and all this sort of stuff. They want to be able to just hook in their own cloud, as they all call it today, um, into Vagrant. So uh, the biggest example of this. They won't let me say their name, but it's basically a very large social network uh, uses Vagrant, and they, <laughs> they hooked it into their own. They run Vagrant up, and they get a dedicated machine somewhere. Um, and that is, was really easy. Uh, but why? Like, why did why does multi-provider matter? Like, why did I waste a year, or some people think I waste, like, a year working on multi-provider stuff? Um, and the, uh, I don't know how many people in here actually, like, would ask me this, because... Uh, the answer is really VirtualBox isn't great for every situation. And if you use Vagrant VirtualBox, a lot of you might know. Right? Um, my my non my opinion my super opinionated uh, slide is this one, which is just really that VirtualBox really sucks. Um, and, it, and the asterisk is, it sucks in the way that like if you if you only know VirtualBox exists, it's actually pretty good. It does what it's supposed to do. But then once you realize anything else exists, you realize it's worse than everything. <laughs> so, that's how it is. Um, but I'll, but if, if VirtualBox is working for you, then nothing changes. VirtualBox is still the only provider shipped with Vagrant. It's like fully supported. Everything. It's still the thing that you use virtual, the Vagrant with. But now there's other options, and I'll explain why that's important. So multiple providers enable Vagrant to do new things that Vagrant just couldn't do before, not because of Vagrant, but because of, of VirtualBox. And what I learned really early on was that people love Vagrant for the workflow and not for VirtualBox. So as a, as a developer, I thought it was really cool that you suddenly had this like command line headless way to control VirtualBox really easy. When I first shipped Vagrant, that's what I thought was cool. And over the past three years, I realized what was cool, what's cool is not that, but actually the workflow that it brings on. So the, the fact that people know, like if you know Vagrant, that you know you could Vagrant up get something running, you Vagrant SSH if you need to, you Vagrant destroy at the end of the day. Like that workflow is what people like. It's not that it's running VirtualBox. The, they just use VirtualBox because they had to. Uh, and other providers really let those people work in an environment that's best for them. So uh, VirtualBox was kind of the last thing that Vagrant said you must do it this way instead of telling Vagrant how you want to do it. And because of this, there's new use cases that Vagrant uh, could do that people tried to do before. Um, but it was it either didn't work or it was super jank or something, um, and now it's actually quite good. So the first one is continuous integration. Uh, pretty much right when Vagrant was released, like 0 0.123 days, people were starting to try this. Um, they saw that Vagrant could automatically run like Chef scripts, and they were like, well, this would be good to see if our Chef scripts even work. Um, and they put Vagrant into the CI, 
and they like really quickly realize that if you throw any amount of parallelism at VirtualBox, its course of action becomes immediately kernel panic. Your machine uh, <laughs> like statement becomes a kernel panic. Machine. So they realized that doesn't work really well. And some people came up with creative uh, solutions to this. There's one person that realized that oh, Vagrant talks to VirtualBox through this one shell script. So they replaced the shell script with basically this global first-in, first-out queue that made sure everything to VirtualBox was, was sequential. And that actually worked, but jank, <laughs> super jank. Um, so uh, with 1.1, you could just not use virt uh, VirtualBox in a CI environment, which is a pretty good idea. Um, and you could use something like AWS. Like maybe if you're already in AWS, it makes sense that you vagrant up and you get an AWS instance to test your shell scripts. That makes sense. Uh, or LXC, if you're if you know all your machines are going to be on Linux anyway, then you could use LXC and it's really fast. So uh, Vagrant's now suddenly pretty good for CI. Uh, another use case: develop locally, test remotely. This is kind of most popular found with consulting firms. Um, the idea is that you can work in VirtualBox, and if you have a properly constructed Vagrant file, then when you need to show someone who works remotely or your client that might be remote or something, you could Vagrant up to AWS and just give them like public DNS and be like, see. This is, what I, this is what's happening, it's what's up. Um, and yeah, it, it works really well, but I really only see it in consulting environments. Deploys, I always, I don't, I hate Vagrant. I, I hate people who want to use Vagrant for deploys, but I don't, I don't hate, that's a strong word. I dislike <laughs> the use case that is deploys for Vagrant. Um, but a lot of people want to just Vagrant up to, to staging or production. I actually don't have a problem with staging, but production, it, it kind of doesn't make sense um, just the way Vagrant was designed to kind of like own the machine at Vagrant Ups, and the idea in production is you probably don't have multiple like owned production environments, you just have one that people are sharing, and Vagrant doesn't really work that way. So people try to make deploys work, um, and it used to be really, really weird because they're trying to use virtual locks in production. Now it's less weird because they're Vagrant Up being like AWS instances, which are fine, but it's still weird. Um, then there's Vagrant and Vagrant. This is actually not a joke. Um, so, again, this is one of those things people tried right away and realized that if you're on VirtualBox and VirtualBox, it just doesn't work. Um, but there's a real use case here. So, Vagrant now works in Vagrant. Uh, and let me explain, let me just explain through an example why this is useful. So, there's another company who uses Vagrant. They required eight VMs for the dev environment. So, Vagrant has a feature where it's able to manage multiple VMs with one configuration file. And they were managing eight per developer. So, that's pretty resource heavy. So they were buying all their developers, their this like super beefed up MacBook Pro, like the $2,700 like MacBook Pro. Um, and they were running eight VirtualBox VMs. Uh, and that was pretty much a limit of that like almost $3,000 machine. And then uh, at this, uh, when Vagrant 1.1 came out, they had an idea, which is now that instead of eight VMs, they're using one giant, but smaller than eight separate VMs, one giant VMware uh, VM. And then within there, they reinstall Vagrant. Uh, with LXC, and they do Vagrant up, and it spins up eight containers because it was a homogenous like OS environment anyway, uh, and that's what they still do today, and it works really well. So Vagrant and Vagrant is actually useful um, sometimes, but it's possible now, and you can actually run VMware in VMware, which is pretty <coughs> impressive from a technological perspective. I think I've gone on this machine on this little 13-inch thing. I've got eight VMware VMs deep, uh, <laughs> <laughs> and then and then I was trying to exit. And then I didn't know how many exits to type in to get actually out of everything. Uh, but luckily, luckily, before I got like completely lost, my OS just just locked. Kernel task went to 100 percent, and I was done. So I just I just restarted. But that's pretty. It's pretty crazy that VMware could do that. Um, and corporate environments. So there's a lot of people that there's a lot of companies that to this day, I mean, tons that give away like one percent of their annual revenue to VMware um, to use their technology and. They kind of were interested in this Vagrant thing, but they couldn't imagine using something other than VMware when they're bleeding that much revenue to them. So uh, now that that excuse is kind of gone because they could use VMware uh, and they could bleed money to me to do that. <laughs> uh, but this is all just the beginning. It's kind of what I've figured out since March. Uh, but people are kind of coming up with new ways to use Vagrant all the time with the provider stuff. Uh, and I think it's since since it's since it's been released, it's less skeptical now. People are using it with AWS a lot, with VMware a lot. It's good. Um, 
So how do you use it? Really just high level how do you use it because there's docs if you really want to know. Um, it's pretty simple. So you run bigger out to get a dev machine. Now you just add this provider flag on the end and tell it what provider you want it to use. So foo could be you know, VMware Fusion, AWS, or whatever you want. Um, you actually have the same Vagrant file and multiple providers, and it, it just really works. And it, that's actually pretty magic when you see it. So going back to Yammer, um, I've always had a pretty good relationship with Yammer. So they were on VirtualBox for probably too long, and they, they finally reached a point where Yammer just couldn't run on, on their machine with VirtualBox anymore. Just, they couldn't do it. Um, so they called me up, and they were like, we either have to switch off Vagrant uh, and do something else, or there got to be a solution. And I was like, well, we could try VMware. Uh, and they were like, okay. So they brought me in uh, to try VM to switch their whole stuff over to VMware. And they, I was in like a conference room, and the, their director of IT left and came back. And I was like, okay, I got him. And he was like, what? And I was like, it's really good. It works now. Like, it uses half the resources. It's good. And then he, he just looked at it, and he was like, it is good. And he's like, well, this is weird. This is awkward, because Yammer budgeted two weeks worth of hours to consult, to contract to you to get this to work, and I did it in 30 minutes. So I kind of shot myself in the foot there. <laughs> I got paid for, I, at least I rounded up to an hour, I don't know. <laughs> I got paid an hour, but I actually used their Vagrant 1.0 Vagrant file and brought it up with VMware without any modifications except removing one plug. Uh, and it just worked. Now it was really cool. Um, so it works, and it's, it's pretty crazy. Um, so here's an example of Vagrant file. It's not sneaky. I think it's the only code sample in the whole slide deck, but it's not sneaky in any way. It's just, it's just what you get if you're on like Vagrant in it. Um, then you add some boxes. Again, not sneaky if you're used to it if you use Vagrant. And then you Vagrant up in VirtualBox or VMware, and that's, that's kind of it. You get one or the other. Um, and it's, it's, there's no catch there. There wasn't anything like sneaky going on behind the scenes. Um, the only thing that might have been weird is that I added two boxes. Uh, but I'll cover that in a second. But that's, that's kind of it. There's, there's no catch there. So the whole thing's best effort. Um, people are pretty quick to point out. They're like, okay, well, you know, something like AWS can't possibly support every feature that Vagrant exposes. And that's true. So, but I don't want someone to do Vagrant up AWS and it to just be like, no. Um, instead, what it does is it just does a best effort. If it, if it sees a feature it can't support, it, it warns you, I'll put something in yellow. It's like, I see you defined like a static IP for your, your instance, and we can't do that in AWS, so I'm just going to ignore that, but do my best to just keep going anyway. And that might cause a failure later with Chef or something that expects that IP, uh, but at least it's trying. It doesn't just bail. And that's kind of what makes these providers work with the same Vagrant file with everything. Um, boxes are now tied to providers, so boxes are the templates that Vagrant uses to clone VMs pretty much. and uh, they're now provider specific. So VirtualBox box is not magically transformed into a VMware machine. Uh, there's various products that do that, and I all think I think they're all crap. Um, so instead of going that route because it's not, it's just not a perfect, it's not a perfect transformation. Um, you have to have your separate images, and Packer helps you kind of maintain those if you want to, but you need separate boxes. Uh, yes, that's what a box is. It's a template for a machine. So for VirtualBox, it'll be an actual VM. For an AMI, is actually just like a less than one kilobyte file that just says what the AMI is. And you, if you run like bigger box list of 1.2 now, you can see they're tied to providers because next to the name, they actually have the provider name. So in this example, when I ran it, I had a CentOS box that would work in VirtualBox, and I had three precise 64 boxes um, that satisfy AWS VirtualBox and VMware Fusion. And you need a box to agree. And that's not true anymore. The process is manual because Packer exists. Okay, um, and kind of the last thing having to do with providers is something called provider-specific configuration. So uh, the problem with a vagrant file is that it's an abstraction. It's both a blessing and a curse. So the blessing is that it's an abstraction, so it's really nice. And the curse is that it's an abstraction, so you lose power. Like it's, that's the definition of abstraction: is they're hiding power to make things simpler. So. Uh, but sometimes it's nice to be able to have those knobs because those knobs exist because someone sometime needed them. Um, and provider-specific configuration kind of exposes those knobs optionally in case you want to use it. So as, a, as an example, setting memory um, is provider-specific. Setting memory uh, in AWS doesn't really have a meaning, but it's useful for VirtualBox and VMware. 
So in these things, I have two provider-specific blocks. One's for VirtualBox, uh, and the other's for VMware. And they just kind of, within these blocks, it's up to the provider to just expose everything that that provider has. So in the VirtualBox one, you see I'm doing a customized call, which actually just shells out to the VBox manage uh, command line interface. I could do anything with VirtualBox. Um, but of course, those that does not translate, or not easily translate at all to VMware. So instead of trying to magically do that, I just kind of uh, expose the VMX, which is the virtual hardware specification for VMware, and you can just set memory that way. Um, and the nice thing about these things is they're portable. So if I gave that file to someone uh, who's running Windows, which doesn't run VMware Fusion, then Vagrant will just totally ignore that block. It's like I don't, I don't even care because you're never going to use VMware Fusion, so I'm just going to ignore it. Um, they have a clear purpose. If if you know you use like VMware and you're trying to modify something with VMware, you know where to look in that Vagrant file. It kind of forces you to organize it a little bit more. Uh, there's power, like I said. This you should be able to do almost anything with the hypervisor underneath using these, uh, and it's totally optional. So, uh, like I said, their best effort. So without these things, they're still going to do what they could do. But you you have these things to to twiddle some knobs. Uh, and that's it. That's all there is to providers. Uh, that's everything there is to providers. If you read the provider docs online, uh, there wouldn't be anything more except how to make one, uh, which is much harder. <laughs> um, and that's kind of all I'm going to talk about bigger today. Uh, now I'm going to talk about Packer. So, not too long. Only like 20 slides about Packer. So, Packer, uh, wait, who here has heard of Packer? That's actually crazy. That's cool. Uh, who here has used it? Yeah, <laughs> two people. Yeah, much, much more normal. Um, so Packer is new, it just came out. Um, what it does is automatically create machine images uh, for multiple platforms from a single configuration file. And that's again that like one sentence kind of dis description of it. Uh, let's break that down a little bit. So a machine image uh, is a single deployable unit that contains the pre-configured OS and some software installed on it. Uh, and here's what an image is for various platforms. So for AWS, an image is an AMI. VMware, VirtualBox, they're the, the VM definition as in disks. Um, for something like DigitalOcean, another cloud provider, it would just be like disk snapshots. It's kind of the closest you get to an image. And uh, DevOps has historically been super against machine images. Um, Chef and Puppet, if you've ever been to one of their training programs, on day one, they, on day one, they basically say, if you ever hear the word like golden image or machine image or anything anywhere in your organization, then you're doing it all wrong. Everything's wrong. Like they just, they, they kind of vilify the word machine image um, and and you get it instilled from day one. So nowadays you get, the, you could go to a conference like Velocity or something or a DevOps days and you get all these ops people in one room um, and they just pretend images don't exist anymore. Uh, and I'm not, I'm not attacking DevOps for that purpose, um, but it's important to understand why this happened, because there's a good reason behind it. Uh, it's important to understand why this happened. So uh, if you go back like 10 years, uh, a lot of companies still do it today, but a, every company did it 10 years ago. So if you go back 10 years, golden images used to be the way. Um, golden images uh, were called golden because they were pressed and they were marked as, as gold and done, and they were deployed. Um, for everything. And these were generally quarterly, they went unchanged, they were, they were uh, printed out quarterly, they were unchanged for that entire, entire quarter and they were blessed by like one guy, um, and you don't know where he is, he just, one guy made it. Um, and this, this, this is what really caused a lot of problems, is that uh, getting any changes into these things was really slow and really frustrating because they, it's, they probably won't change it in the quarter, like unless it's like a serious security patch or something, they're not going to change that image, it's good. Um, and you got to find the one guy uh, who will get it in for you somehow, or follow some really like tedious ticket process to get it through. Um, but this was kind of a necessary evil while tooling wasn't as good. Um, you know, you had some, you had, I don't know what you call it, but the beginnings of configuration management back then, but it was pretty frightening still. Um, so what you ended up doing was mostly manually setting up these servers, manually doing a lot of things. And because it was manual, any sort of changes to it were a threat, because you don't know what's really going to change. Um, so you had the one guy who manually uh, 
caringly put this thing together and then marked it as good when it seemed to be good. Um, and you kind of, for, for safety reasons, from an ops perspective, this is kind of what you had to do. Um, and then with modern configuration management, it, was, it became suddenly very easy to simply ignore images, um, to, to kind of just skip that guy, because suddenly you could have a base operating system installation and just run Chef on top of it, and in half an hour get everything you need anyway. So what's the point of images? So you could just bypass that whole thing. And with modern configuration management, you can version it. You can see, you know, you can change things. And so uh, it was easy to ignore it, and it was also easy to just vilify it the old way as a way to kind of push forward um, into these new tools. But because of that, almost everyone's forgotten the benefits that machine images have. Because machine images do have a lot of benefits, uh, a ton. Um, and we've lost almost all those benefits uh, in, in the way we're doing things now. And we gained a lot of benefits from, from moving to you know, Chef and Puppet and these practices, but we also lost totally different benefits. So some of those benefits, um, one is super fast infrastructure deployment. So even considering like the fastest like Chef run I could imagine, which would be probably for like a web server because it's pretty stateless or something, even doing something like that, um, you're, from the moment the machine becomes available to the moment uh, Chef finishes running, is the fastest I've seen is maybe like five minutes, two minutes, if I want to give you something, but probably more like 10. Um, if you're doing, stu doing something stateful, like a DB or something, um, you're looking at a lot more, like 30 minutes, two hours, I don't know. Um, but with images, it's you just launch it and it's done, it's running. <laughs> There's no more run step after that. If you stamped out an image that is your web server, you just launch 10, launch 10 in AWS in parallel, and in 30 seconds you have 10 web servers that are accepting traffic. Um, it's super fast. You get real like multi-cloud portability. So if you create images for an AMI and you create a virtual box image and you create them as identical as possible, then you really could kind of you can't like you know of course you can't move your production infrastructure from one cloud to another. That's there's a lot more involved than just software in there. But you could at least run parts of it in totally different areas uh, for various you know dev staging test purposes. Uh, you get a lot of stability and testability, so a lot, there's a lot of work going into like testing Chef right now where you run it in the CI and you test Chef, but there's a lot of outside influencers to Chef, and they're mitigatable, but at a cost. So, uh, for example, the, the one that usually buys people is like apt. Like if, if, your apt, if your apt index isn't available, repository isn't available, then you can't install packages. And yeah, you can install app cachers and stuff, but just you're, you continue adding layers, and then once you have app cachers, there's other problems. Um, so you just got to figure out where you care. Um, so you, you run Chef in a CI and everything passes, and then you launch that server one week later, and suddenly things fail because someone pushed a new someone pushed a new version to app or something and it doesn't work anymore. Um, surprise. So there's these outside influencers to Chef and Puppet that, again, I want to are fixable, but usually people don't fix them. So uh, you run into the problems. But if you stamp out a golden image or an image, then you could launch that thing a year from now, and it's still going to work. Uh, there's no outside uh, dependencies anymore. Um, and so testability is improved because you, you build the image, you make sure Chef run, you use Chef or something to build the image. You don't give Chef is not gone anymore. You, you use Chef to like build the image, and then uh, you, te you then launch the image and do various tests on it to see if it's functioning in some way, uh, whatever that means for you. And then you just save it because you know if that passes, then it's actually going to work a week from now, a month from now. Um, and you don't need to worry about outside influencers killing you. Um, so basically what Packer does is it brings all these benefits of machine images um, without the downsides. And because it's a, a modern tool or designed to be a modern tool, it embraces the current best practices. So like I said, it doesn't get rid of Chef or Puppet. Uh, it encourages you to actually use those in order to build the images. Uh, and encourage a bunch of other best practices too, like automation. So Packer, uh, the idea is that you, just like Chef or Puppet, where you encoded all your config management stuff into um, human readable scripts that are in uh, version control so you can track them over time. You now encode the process with which you build machine images and for what platforms into similar human readable text formats um, that you can version control and see over time. Um, and then once you run, you know, once you tell Packer to build something, it's completely automated and hands off. You just wait. But, uh, I already said you use config management to install things. You don't, you don't even go back to writing shell scripts or something. You could. Um, repeatability is really important. So just like uh, Packer is the same idea. You could just run it, and as long as 
the, the template, which is what it uses to know how to build things at that template. As long as the template's the same and all the files it depends on, like the various chef cookbooks are the same and stuff, it'll spit out the same image. Um, and, and those are kind of important. So what could Packard do with enough high-level machine image stuff? Like, what does it actually do? So it takes a human-slash-machine-readable JSON, human-slash-machine-readable template as an input, and it outputs one or more artifacts, which are generally machine images. But it could be artifacts because it could also be like a vagrant box or something. Uh, right now, Packard is able to build AMIs, um, instant store and EBS AMIs. Uh, it's able to build digital ocean snapshots, VMware machines. That's the Fusion logo, but it works with uh, Workstation and Player as well, um, and VersaBox machines. And it could do all of these. And from all of these, it could also make vagrant boxes from all of them. So, uh, and it can do all of those in parallel, so uh, it can do that for you. And it's completely accessible, so you can add new builders, like if you want to build for OpenStack. Um, you can add new provisioners if you want to, I don't know, do uh, one that's not supported around Ansible or something. Uh, and post-processors, I don't know, I don't know I'm not going to go into it. Um, but yeah, Packer was released in, like, in just a couple months ago, uh, but there's already a lot of companies getting it, and they're already using it. Um, because at the very least, what it's doing for them is automating their vagrant image installs. Um, but most already are taking that to the next level and doing production. It was built with production in mind. So check it out at packer.io. That's the web page. Um, and thank you. That's pretty much all I have. And before, uh, so I have, I forgot. I thought I packed vagrant stickers, but I don't actually have them. But I have packer stickers, which are pretty cool, actually. They're like, they're this P. So if you want the uh, Packer stickers, then I have 50. That's enough for everyone. Uh, that's it. Thank you. I don't know. Any questions or anything? Or? Sure. You got different time. Questions. Yeah, there's not. Do you have a couple uh, other questions? Yeah. Sure. In, um, for Packer, you just mentioned that you have some companies using it in production. Mm -hmm. So what is the use case that they're using it for? And you know, have, they, have they shifted their infrastructure over back to images? And I'm kind of thinking, I remember the old images stuff as well, yeah. and versioning those images. You kind of bring that back at some level. Because so you still have to run like RHN on top of it, or if you're in the real world. Yeah, you don't need to worry too much about uh, versioning the images anymore, because you should be able to recreate them at any right. point. Um, but these companies are using them for production and development, and a lot of the old, I mean, the, the companies they're using are more cloud-based, so you're not talking about people re-imaging, uh, you know, hardware, you're talking about, like, relaunching an AMI or something, which is far simpler, yeah. so that, right now the early adopters are kind of in that realm, but they're not changing their practices too much around it, it's just, it's speeding up their deploys, so they're not, they're not just deploying static images, they're pre-baking most of a chef run, and you know, so like chef is item potent, so you could pre-bake most of the software, and then launch it, and just still run chef on it, except the initial time so to ready readiness is much faster. Right. So they're not changing anything, they're just using it as a, a kickstart, a head start. Gotcha. Yeah. And not kickstart the realm. <laughs> Any other questions? Yeah. Uh, I think a while ago you mentioned to me that, um, I asked you if we could make QCOW2 images uh, with Packer. Is that something that's if I can make what? QCOW2 images for uh, KVM? Oh, yeah. I, I, there's no technical reason blocking that. It's just... Is that something where a provider would need to be built? Or a builder, yeah. A builder? Okay. Yeah. It, from everyone I've talked to, though, it just sounds pretty easy. I just don't have experience with KVM. So, yeah, there's no technical blocker to that. It's just a manpower blocker. How far off or is there going to be an ESX provider? Uh, there's already a... So I skimmed over the post-processor thing. Post-processors basically take in an artifact and do something with it. There's already a post-processor that'll take a, like, a VM built workstation and then upload it to a vSphere endpoint. Um, it's close, but uh, an ESX pro a builder, or did you have a builder or provider? Provider, provider oh, sorry. Uh, a provider, uh, there's an open source one if you search bigger in vSphere. Um, there's an open source one. I am developing one, but it's just coming along really slow. It's mostly lack of demand. Trivial workflow question, but I guess you've seen more of it than anyone. Uh -huh. Where I run into like frustrations is when I'm bouncing between VirtualBox and Fusion. 
it's always a networking thing. Oh yeah. That ends up just making you restart the machine. Yeah. Out of frustration. So have you seen that most people just pick one and stick with it? Like I go back and forth because I have virtual box, but yeah. like I know some part time people just have fusion because it's free and we don't give them the software. Yeah. I want to be able to run on the same like team. You know. Yeah. So I bring it up. Is, do most people just stick with one or do they go? Yeah. Can okay, you have a question back there? Okay. Uh, so the question was. If you're using, his, his problem is if you're using VirtualBox and the VMware stuff, um, he runs into networking issues every time he switches from one or the other, which ends up having to just restart his machine to fix it. Um, so the problem is the actual like root cause of this was, this is like one of the early problems I ran into and it's driving me crazy. The problem is that VirtualBox, when you shut down all the VMs, doesn't remove its virtual networking. So it owns those subnets, and by default, VMware ships using the same subnets. So when you do a vagrant up, uh, VirtualBox already owns them. So, and, and virtual VMware doesn't fail, it just keeps booting. Your networking just doesn't work. So, um, the, the Vagrant stuff is a lot of a lot of code written to detect this sort of thing. Um, it inspects, like, it does trace routes internally, it does kernel, uh, it does route table dumps. It does a bunch of stuff to figure out, is your networking gonna work? And it'll tell you if it's not. But the problem is if it's not, it's not clear how to fix it. Um, and it can't automatically fix it, but usually the problem is just looking and trying to find all the virtual box processes and killing all of them. It's annoying. So you say people mostly just oh. stick with one or the other? <coughs> yeah, general, like the, in general people, people, well you can change the, there's a there's like a knowledge base article on the VMware website, you can change the default sum that it uses, and then they don't collide anymore. That fixes it. Yep. Uh, yeah, so say you, uh, you're developing and you have a, like a Mac and you, uh, have a bunch of VMs that you need to spin up. Uh, what's the recommended provider in that? Is it VMware? Um, hey, Vir so VirtualBox is free. Uh, I hate talking about VMware that much because it costs money. Like you, you have to pay me money also to use it. Okay. And I don't like making like it a sales pitch. Um, but I mean, you Google everywhere. VMware uses less memory and it's faster. Um, <laughs> it's just almost better in every way except price. So. <laughs> If you, I mean, if you work for a company, then you just expense it. <laughs> I would say if you're getting started with Vagrant, just use VirtualBox because it's free, really low barrier to entry. And if you're using it more seriously, then at least look into the VMware stuff. And if you email me, I'll give you trials and stuff like to prove to you that it's better. Okay. Yeah. One of the things I noticed recently when I was trying to build out a Ubuntu um, 13 or 4 box mm -hmm. is that the official images are running on older Ubuntu distro, mm -hmm. and obviously th there's the community-based ones. Is the idea that you're going to stop maintaining official vagrant, um, you know, pre-built? Uh, I'll probably always maintain a little bit, but like Canonical has taken over. Canonical makes vagrant boxes for all, all their releases now, uh, mm -hmm. and uh, Red Hat's doing the same now for RHEL. It's uh, the CentOS project for the CentOS. So I think a lot of my the burden's gone. But what it's kind of switching to is what I'm going to do is I build those boxes with Packer. So what I'll end up doing is just publishing the Packer templates I use. I so you can just customize it and run a command and get it in like 10 minutes of customizing. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. This is about a virtual box. But um, we used to, we have a piece of software that is tied to a MAC address mm -hmm. uh, with a licensing scheme. And we used to be able to set a static MAC address when we were bringing up the virtual box. It doesn't work anymore. Is there any plan to fix that? It's or? a bug. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't know if you knew about that or if that was something that was just no, just no, I didn't know that. <laughs> uh, it's a bug. Cool. Bug report. Yeah. <laughs> I won't remember. You gotta. You gotta <laughs> yeah. <open six. laughs> Is there a question over here? I was gonna say with the virtual box at uh, my place, we actually do set the back address in uh, Vagrant. We use it to make our uh, our Vagrant boxes first class citizens in our data center. It does work, but I think the syntax is really weird. I oh, think uh, if you check that overflow, I actually uh, answered my own question. Oh, that. Yeah. <laughs> I think yes. that's like my highest karma giving thing on there. <laughs> Not a bug, won't fix. <laughs> <laughs> we'll see. About
considering that he came across the country to this, that's a nice relief for all the organizers. Um, <laughs> uh, thanks to you for coming out here. We appreciate it. Uh, so thank you there. And thanks to my company, whoever for hosting this meetup, because if they didn't, we wouldn't have this cool venue. So it's really awesome. And all the equipment. So um, that's it.